So he broke Western form. He broke Japanese form. He broke, um, <coughs> he even broke his own directions. A friend of mine who was in his company said that every four years, Hichikata would just totally reinvent his own dance. So these days, he, uh, I would say that these days, there are so many different manifestations of a thing called buto dance. There are many, many looks and feelings and forms, and some of it uh, reflects um, his later work, some of it reflects his earlier work, and it depends on who happened to have been working with him at that time, and then their particular directions. So this thing, again, is being called Buto dance, it, it has all these different stages. Experimental art at the beginning, and at the end, it's a kind of new tradition. So at the end, he's creating something that he's starting to call uh, Tohoku Kabuki. So Tohoku is the region in which he's, he's from. And kabuki is a, a form of, of theater dance that he started to feel had lost its, its oomph. So the originator of kabuki is a woman named Okuni. And Okuni started doing her, her works on the riversides in Kyoto. And it was, it was bawdy. It was, it was uh, you know, in a certain way, it was rebellious. And this rebelliousness then uh, started to change. It became codified in a, in a very big way. The government said no women are allowed to perform this now, only men. And, and then it became a very high art, so to speak. Eric, you have a question. Uh, I'd like to share uh, an image that Shinichi gave me during a workshop I took with him, which was to imagine that you're moving on an infinite plane of glass, and that every time you take a step, it cracks the glass, and you're uh, at danger of falling through. And that was one of the most profound physical and mental experiences that I had. But it made me slow down to just an incredible amount. And I wonder if you could talk about slowness as a quality of Buddha. Mm. Yeah. So slowness is one of those things that is, is highly associated with, with Buddha dance. And it's not the thing that defines it. It's not always the case that you're going to be slow moving. But in a situation like that, if the image dictates it, right? If the, I, I told you this? You did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so plate of glass, fear of breaking, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so automatically, again, there's all sorts of things happening in the body that say, all right, where is my weight? How is my weight distributed? And so if you're in this kind of thing, naturally you want to you move in a fairly slow way. I start to generate my feeling reaction to the physical action. And so the stories start generating inside the body from the physical action. So in other words, I can start from the physical action, not have an image, not have a story, and the story comes out. So it's, in, in a way, it's, there's two ways to approach it. Here's the image. Image affects the body. Body changes because of the image. And the other thing is make, a, make it something very definite with the body. And then that calls in your own stories. And your own stories come into play. If I let my back or the midpoint of the back hang down, then that makes uh, a shape on the body. And then if I have that idea, and in combination with some kind of animal form, then that makes an effect here. And I had this experience a long time ago going into uh, a Cherokee sweat lodge. And in that Cherokee sweat lodge, um, they had 
they had the, the door to the sweat lodge about down here. So everyone had to, had to enter in down there. And as, they, as you go in, you had to actually stand all fours. The person who was leading the sweat, so to speak, said it like this, that it reminds us when we do this that we're not different from the animals. Shoulders, upper body, they have nowhere to go. They have no gravity to pull them one direction or the other direction. Image after image after image after image comes in and you accept those images. You're empty enough so that something can enter and then um, by being empty, um, you can become full with the thing. But then you become full with the thing and you, you, allow, uh, you allow an exit. And the exit might be like a slow leak or the exit might be some kind of uh, 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 like a snap or a shift or a very sudden occurrence. And a lot of people who call themselves Bhutto dancers are from a particular branch or line you know, that, that represents a different mode of thinking and a different style. Um, but one of the ways of thinking is that, yeah, you've simply erased the body, you've erased your identity, and in the erasure of your identity, you've become open, you've become neutral. And anything that is neutral can accept new information. So we're going to do a little collaborative dance right now. And it's going to be collaborative in this way, in that I am only neutral. That's to say, I am ready to receive something. And you are going to input something. Um, into this blank being. Because you just have to shout it out. It just comes out of you. You have an imaginary tail and it's slowly catching on fire like it's a bomb that's going to go off. And there's carrots growing out of the top of your head. Suspicious shellfish are all over the ground. <laughs> <laughs> So, as I was saying, mm -hmm. as the last of my species, I'm open for questions. <laughs> <laughs> the language can point towards impossibilities. So, for example, for you to stand and hang off the earth, logically speaking, logically speaking, you, you can totally reject this. You can say, this is illogical. This is not happening. So therefore, I can't participate in this. But if you can turn off that little bit of logic, and I'm not quite sure if I'm totally addressing your question, but in any case, in the speaking of things or in the describing of things, if you can turn off a logic and go towards a uh, acceptance of the most ridiculous proposal, uh, then, then the bodies capacity increases. <laughs>